Hello and welcome to Comic Culture. I'm Terrence Dollard, a professor in the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. My guest today is Ramsey Fawaz. He's the author of this new book, The New Mutants, Superheroes and the Radical Imagination of American Comics. Ramsey, welcome to Comic Culture. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So you are in academics uh, and you're writing about comics from that point of view. Uh, what is it about comics that makes you want to do uh, essentially um, an entire book's worth of research? <laughs> Uh, it's a great question. Um, I think there's two different things that have motivated me to write this book. And one is just my own personal love of comics. I grew up reading them uh, as a young gay man in suburban Orange County, California. I felt a deep sense of, of identification with characters like the X-Men, like the Fantastic Four, who were kind of social and genetic outcasts who found kinship with one another in lots of different forms. And so in that sense, I have kind of a, just a deep, visceral, uh, playful attachment to the medium. But I'm also interested in the medium because of the different ways in which it's told so many different kinds of stories using the genre of fantasy. I'm interested in why Americans have been really drawn to the fantastical elements of comics for over you know eight decades. And so as an academic, I became really fascinated with that question and I wanted to understand why these kind of intimate, local, playful aspects of comics that people experience, you know, when they sit in their room with a new issue, also captured the imagination of hundreds of thousands of Americans over the years. And so it's that fantasy element of the medium that really um, led me to want to tell a different kind of story about comics and about the power that they have over the American imagination. Now, what's interesting is uh, I was uh, actually giving a presentation recently about uh, DC characters on television. And when we look at the, uh, the period that the shows were created, you see that there's a parallel to the way the society views authority. Um, and what's interesting is that when we see superheroes emerge uh, in the comic book uh, genre, that becomes sort of the signature, um, the signature storytelling. Um, there are comics of all different uh, story types and genres out there, but it seems most people associate superheroes with comics. Um, and in your book, you talk a little bit about the various eras of comics, starting with the Golden Age. And I was wondering, um, as I noticed in my research on television, uh, noticing different attitudes towards uh, different times and whatnot, I was wondering what you had discovered in, let's say, the Golden Age when you know, we're seeing the, the birth of Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, and those types of characters. You know, I think what we see in the Golden Age is a kind of extended meditation in superhero comic books, which are invented in this area, uh, in this era, um, on the question of power and agency. Um, when you think about it, superheroes were invented in the late 1930s, uh, beginning with Superman in Action Comics number one in 1938. Um, and this is a moment in which kind of the twin pillars of Americanism, democracy and capitalism, are an incredible crisis. Uh, and so what we see is that superheroes are kind of fantasy of what it would be like to um, have power over the world uh, in a moment when people feel deeply disempowered, when people feel that they have no control over the economy, over the future of American politics. Um, you have characters who have power as an extension of their bodies. Um, and so in that sense, I think that superheroes were an attempt to think through the various ways in which people could fantasize themselves into positions of power or to imagine fantasy figures who could empower them. So I talk often um, when, I'm, when I'm asked questions about the Golden Age about the scholar Bradford Wright's claim that Superman was a super new dealer. He supported the common man. He supported the rights of workers and unions against uh, corrupt bosses. So in many ways, he wasn't simply a fantasy that people wanted to project themselves into. He was an icon of what people um, wanted their government to uh, do for them. They wanted to feel supported as ordinary people, as the working class, et cetera, in the face of um, uh, you know, the corruption of capitalism, et cetera. So I think that the golden age is not merely a pure, unfettered fantasy of power. I think it's an extended fantasy about what we could do with power. How could power be used ethically for ordinary people? And so I think that's kind of an extraordinary through line uh, of that period. Now, this is something that I've been uh, sort of working over in my mind. When we read these books, um, obviously we, we're reading them with a, a mind towards 
how everything's kind of put together with that 2020 hindsight. In your, uh, I guess, estimation, your opinion, are the writers actually working these details out, or is this just because of the times, this is the art they create in the times? A great question. I always struggle with this. People are always really interested in the question of intention and intentionality. No doubt, I think that comic book creators were incredibly savvy, intelligent people who were plugged into their culture at every historical moment from the 30s all the way to the present. So they knew to a certain degree what they were doing. But of course, the demands of the medium, the speed with which you have to produce comics, the volume with which you have to produce them, means that when comic book creators like Stan Lee like Jack Kirby, uh, you know, and others were producing comics, they couldn't always be thinking about every detail and every the meaning of every single panel. So in many ways, they had intentions, but what they produced circulated in the wider world and gained meaning far beyond what they intended. So in a lot of ways, I actually, as funny as it sounds, I don't care what creators intend, usually when I'm analyzing comics. Not because it doesn't matter, but because at the end of the day, if hundreds of thousands or millions of people are reading, circulating, and attaching meaning to comics, then whatever the creators intended ultimately um, isn't what l leads to the final um, interpretation that exists out there. So what I always interest myself in is not simply what did creators mean or intend, but what were the various meanings that different readers attached to them? And how was it possible that the comic books made those meanings available to people? Uh, you know, like why, if, if the, even if the creators didn't intend something, for instance, I talk a lot about the fact that it's an open question whether or not Stan Lee and Jack Kirby intended the invisible girl in the Fantastic Four to be an icon of feminism. But there was no question that you couldn't invent a woman character who turns invisible in this, like, you know, within the same year and a half that Betty Friedan publishes The Feminine Mystique, at the same moment that second wave feminism is coming onto the American scene, and not have that character have some kind of meaning related to the emergence of feminists of second wave feminist thought and so of course readers completely thought of her as a kind of feminist figure and they took her up in these very complicated interesting ways so so that's just a kind of a long way of saying um creator intention is just one variable of so many others that accounts for the meaning that gets produced around comics okay and if you don't mind we, we can just go back to the golden age for a moment um when Superman comes out, it's at the height of the Depression. Uh, the American worker is, is down on his or her luck. Um, but then World War II comes along, and we see a, a shift in, in the characters and uh, the attitudes. And I'm just wondering how you see the, uh, the change in the, uh, the view of the American uh, public uh, during the war and how that is reflected in the books that are being produced at that time and, and immediately after. Comic books were unbelievably popular uh, before World War II and then during the war. They were read by GIs on the front lines of both theaters of the war, circulated around the world. Um, and again, of course, during a period of incredible military um, uh, intervention globally, they were these kind of fantasies or meditations about ethical uses of power. But when we think about it, you know, World War II ends with a certain kind of American supremacy or hegemony around the world. And in many ways, Americans had no use for superheroes after World War II. When you have control over the atom bomb, um, when you kind of is, uh, are victorious in a, in a global conflict, in a sense, like, why do you need superheroes when you can split the atom? And so for a decade or more, American comic books, um, you know, superheroes as a genre kind of go out of vogue in the United States. And what Americans are really reading are crime and horror comic books. They become the most popular genre um, of the field. But what happens by the mid-1950s is that they begin to be associated with juvenile delinquency, with communism, with the collapse of American kind of social norms. Um, and of course, a lot of these assumptions are incredibly wrong. Um, they're deeply anti-teenager, kind of anti-queer or anti-non-normative. Um, um, but what happens is that comic book creators have to kind of rethink what genres they want to work in if they're not going to be censored or if they're if they're going to still sell comics. And so what we get in the late 1950s is a return to the superhero. But of course, 
in the context of the late 50s and early 60s, superheroes necessarily had to evolve and transform for a new generation of American youth. And so part of what I argue in the book is that when the superhero comes back into vogue in the late 50s, it returns as a genetic and a species outcast. It no longer is a figure like Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, who represent idealized, perfected forms of humanity. Instead, we get superheroes who are mutants, who are freaks, who sit outside of the American social order. And you get this running up against a generation of American youth who don't want to be normal, who want to be maladjusted and abnormal because they want to resist some of the social norms of the 1950s that demanded gender conformity, domesticity, um, you know, the attachment to consumer goods, suburban life. You see a generation of youth that want to break out of that mold for very ethical and political reasons. Reasons. And so superheroes kind of re-enter the American cultural scene at a perfect moment when, when what we now call the counterculture, um, the generation of American youth who were pressing back against certain traditions and norms, uh, was emerging. And part of what the book tracks is the convergence of these two historical facts. And one of the things I, I was reading in the book, um, you have a chapter about the, the Justice League and how many of their foes are basically an allegory for communism, uh, especially Starro the Conqueror, uh, which is something that, you know, when I read it now, it makes perfect sense. But when I was reading those early issues uh, in reprints, I think to myself, well, I, I just don't get Starro. What's, what's the appeal as a, as a character? And at the same time, in another chapter, you're talking about the Fantastic Four, and they're contemporaries. I believe the story is that the, the uh, publisher of uh, Timely Comics, which would become Marvel, was on the golf course with the publisher of uh, National Publications, which would become DC. And he said, yeah, we've got this book called The Justice League. It's selling great. And so the publisher from Timely goes to Stanley and says, team books. I want a team book. And they came out with yeah. the Fantastic Four. So I was wondering if you could sort of... Uh, take a look at both of those approaches to uh, superheroes, that sort of that Marvel style that would create the Marvel Universe, and the sort of, I want to say, uh, sort of establishment of the Justice League heroes. Yeah. I think that the key distinction between these two teams, which ends up defining the two companies and their ethos or their worldview, really has to do with, on the one hand, DC Comics' a deep attachment to liberal thought um, and Marvel Comics' increasing attachment in the 60s to kind of radical, non-normative, and what we might now call post-human forms of belonging. So let me kind of explain those two distinctions. I think DC Comics was really attached to a liberal idea of human agency, the idea that people are free because they have free will, um, that that free will is can be harnessed to democratic and egalitarian forms of political governance, um, that that is secured through things like law and order, the, uh, like the rule of law, collective, um, and the collective good. So what you get in DC is the invention of the superhero team, the Justice League of America, America, who is deeply committed to the idea of maintaining concepts of law and order, not only around the globe, but intergalactically. What is beautiful and quite expansive about this vision is that the Justice League imagined what the collective good would look like outside of the boundaries of the nation. So even though they were called the Justice League of America, they served all kinds of cosmic beings throughout the universe. They travel the globe, they protect people against a variety of forms of oppression, and so even though the comic book begins with this villain, Starro the Conqueror, who looks like a model of communism, ultimately they fight all kinds of fascist, dictatorial, uh, violent um, uh, leaders of different kind of galaxies who simply are oppressive. Um, now, the limit of that vision, and I should say part of the liberalism of that vision, is that the comic book really is an extension of ideas like the United Nations and UNESCO and other international cooperative organizations in the 1950s and 60s. So it's an extension of American liberal democracy to the globe. I think what the, what the Justice League could never deal with is the fact that no matter how much you are attached to liberal ideas, there are always people around the world who are perceived as standing outside of the human. People who are seen as subhuman or outside of the category on the basis of their race, their ability, their sexuality, their class, etc. 
And so there was a way in which the Justice League had a utopian or idealized notion that if people simply work together across cultures, that all problems could be solved, that ultimately human beings are all equal and like we share our humanity. What's interesting about Marvel Comics is that it acknowledged the fact that numerous people stand outside of what we call the human. And what's fascinating about that comic book is that it presents us a superhero team, the Fantastic Four, who look like a normal white American nuclear family. They're upper class, they have money, they're, um, they are perceived as space champions by their government. And because of a freak encounter with cosmic rays out, you know, in outer space, they're transformed into mutated freaks who then come to stand outside of the boundaries of the human. So the comic book asks this interesting question, which is what happens when the white nuclear family, which seems like the, the icon of being normal, becomes inhuman? What happens when uh, a group of white people essentially become racialized and gendered and sexualized and stand outside of the norms of humanity? Well, the effect is that they become intergalactic space adventurers who just want to meet everyone else who's not normal. Right. And so the comic book becomes this beautiful kind of extended story about cosmopolitan um, an open-minded engagement with all kinds of people um, throughout the cosmos and around the world. And so I think that's kind of the difference. I think Marvel spends the next 30 years kind of exploring what it means for superheroes who stand outside of what it means to be human to meet other people like them, but who still aren't identical to them. It's interesting because in both cases, it seems like there's an optimism, an underlying optimism in the, mm -hmm. the characters and the concepts, whether it's uh, we just need to talk and we can work it out, or it's, hey, let's embrace our differences. Um, mm -hmm. And it seems that things start to change, perhaps in the, the mid to late 70s, we start to see a shift. I believe uh, there were uh, issues of Spider-Man where he deals with uh, drug dealers. Uh, and of course, yes. the famous uh, Green Lantern, Green Arrow series where we find out that Speedy's a junkie. Um, I just like saying Speedy's a junkie, by it's, the way. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when we start to see this shift, what's what's going on in America? That is it just simply because they're bringing in new blood, or is it simply a matter of again the country is changing and we need to uh, just a adapt these characters to the the era that they're in? I think it's a mix of both. I think certainly comic books, as the as their popularity resurges in American culture, they become co these companies become very attentive to how to sell comics. So in many ways, a lot of the decisions they make about the content of the comics is shaped by changing social and historical factors, including the fact that by the 70s, readers want to see more of what comes to be called relevance. They want to see comic books deal with questions of environmentalism, of drug abuse, of racism, of urban blight. And so comic books kind of speak to that in order to kind of um, get the attention of uh, you know, this generation of readers who want more relevant content. But I also think that what we see in these comics is um, the fact that they absorbed the reality that Americans had become exhausted with the limits of liberal thought. And what I mean by that is not liberal versus conservative. I mean that Americans come to realize that certain classical ideas about individual willpower, agency, freedom, democracy are starting to collapse. They're not working. So no matter how much you say to people like, you know, I'm invested in the idea of freedom of will and individualism and self-fashioning and self-creation, Americans are looking around and they're saying, uh, you know, only very few people have access to uh, economic freedom, to the ability to be upwardly mobile. What do you say to the rest of Americans, you know, minorities, women, African Americans, you know, queer people who are not getting access to the American dream? Like, what can they do in the face of those realities. And I think what you see is a kind of deep despair and despondency in the failure of certain kinds of liberal values to really make good on their promise of the good life. And so I think you see comics in the 1970s really struggling to maintain their classic kind of liberal optimism in freedom and, and individual will and agency, um, and also try and invent other ways of being in the world that acknowledge the limits of liberal thought. So for instance, um, 
like you mentioned, Green Lantern, Green Arrow is a deeply uh, melancholic comic book. It really kind of spends a lot of time thinking through the failures of urban renewal, of uh, racism in inner cities. And yet the foil to that comic book is the X-Men in the 70s, which is revitalized as this incredibly international, multicultural um queer menagerie of mutants who say, you know what, if we're not going to be included, if we're not going to be welcomed within the limits of liberal thought, let's invent a completely new way of being in the world. I, in the book, I call this, it's an odd phrase, but I call this a queer mutanity against a liberal notion of a universal humanity. So the X-Men basically say, hey, listen, if liberalism presumes that everyone is ultimately human and that's what binds us all together, and we know that that's not actually true, that in fact lots of people are left out of the human, then why don't we create a completely different way of being knitted together on the basis of the fact that we fail to approximate the human? And so this produces lots of different kinds of relationships that are new and innovative and exciting. And so, yeah, it's a long way of saying, I think the comic books were trying to invent a different form of politics. And so they struggled through a period of despair in order to do that. We end up seeing a, a much darker period in the 80s. And I'm not sure that we're, we're seeing it shift back. I think we have some more optimistic books coming out now, especially mm -hmm. from publishers other than Marvel or DC. Uh, seeming, uh, it seems that DC just wants everything to be dark and moody. Um, but it's, fasc it's a fascinating change, yeah. Um, but well, let's talk about Jean Grey for a moment, because you, you talk about her mm -hmm. in your book. Uh, Jean Grey, of course, is Marvel Girl, which is another one of those uh, Marvel titles where we, we call a woman a girl, because why wouldn't we? Yeah. Um, and she becomes the character of Phoenix, and then uh, she is corrupted by uh, someone from the Hellfire Club. So I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that transformation and what you see uh, when we see that transformation. Sure. And let me quickly make an aside. I think it's interesting what you mentioned about the word girl. I think a lot of people tend to presume that the, the use of the word Marvel girl or invisible girl was a sexist idea. But I actually think it was simply that they wanted to sell to young girls. They wanted to sell these characters to youth. So they didn't want teenagers to feel that these characters were already women, that they were already grown up and that they, they couldn't identify with those characters. Like after all, like, you know, Marvel Girl is like 16 when she joins the X-Men. So I think it's actually kind of an interesting marketing question. Um, you know, Marvel Girl and her transformation into the Phoenix is one of the most extraordinary narratives of female development, character development in the history of comics. And one of the things I always say about her is that she, she is fascinating because she is the emblem of normal white womanhood. She was the girl next door that every boy wanted to marry and she became a god. She became, in many ways, the complete opposite of what, what a woman was presumed to, to need to be in American culture. So I often point out to people, if you read the first issue of the X-Men, often what people do is they interpret the original X-Men series of 1964 as an allegory for the civil rights movement. And they argue that the key tension in that comic was between a vision that is like Martin Luther King Jr., um, you know, a pe the idea of peaceful relationships between human and mutant kind represented by Professor Xavier, and a more kind of militant form of mutant civil rights represented by Magneto. But I would argue that the first issue actually reveals a very different tension, which is between the disciplinary, ordered, structured world of Xavier. He wants to have stu mutants study at a school. He wants them to learn the use of their powers. He's strict. He's a disciplinarian. And then the in entry of the chaotic energies of this young woman. I really think the comic book is actually organized around that. The minute she enters the school, the boys all go crazy. They lose their minds and their discipline. And she becomes this constant figure of disruption. Um, I think by the 70s, creators realized that that could be harnessed to visualize the transformation of the American superhero by the values of liberal feminism and radical feminism. And so her transformation to the Phoenix is an extraordinary moment, both visually and in, in terms of narrative, where a woman superhero literally embodies all of the central values of radical, especially white feminism. 
she she literally looks like a, a physical manifestation of the idea of I am woman, hear me roar. Um, she experiences almost a psychedelic unraveling of her identity that transforms her into a new consciousness. So she embodies ideas of consciousness raising. And she, in some sense, comes out of the closet. She becomes a very different kind of woman. And this opens her out into a whole host of new relationships, including her deep friendship with the character Storm, uh, arguably the first mainstream black woman superhero. And so I think what's interesting is that her transformation leads her to be closer with other women than with the men on the team. So her fiance Cyclops feels deeply alienated by her because suddenly she's she's more mature, she's older, she has more power. And th it is another woman on the team who recognizes that power and says, I affirm you. And we see that over the course of the history of the comic book. So. I think that Jean Grey really deserves a lot more attention in scholarship because she really represents uh, a complete transformation in thinking about women superheroes uh, from the 60s and after. Well, I'm being told we have about one minute left, okay. uh, which granted is, is probably just not enough time to talk about everything, but the name of the book is The New Mutants, and I, I remember you were showing me the, the yeah. shirt you're wearing beforehand. Do you mind yes. showing us your New Mutant shirt? Yeah, um, classic New Mutants. Uh, so what was it about the New Mutants? Uh, we have, again, about a minute left. What yeah, was it about sure. the New Mutants that, that drew you in, that made you want to uh, name the book that, that made you a fan of the book yeah. in general? It's simple. The New Mutants is the first comic book that ever asked, what would superheroes be like if they didn't want to save the world? And so it, it spends all of this time thinking about what it means for people to decide that they want to be ethical instead of to feel that they are forced into it by virtue of having superpowers. And so it models what democracy is all about, which is the idea that we have to collectively decide what we want to do with our world in the absence of assumed or um, presupposed ideas about what the world should be. And so the comic book is a beautiful visual experiment in changing the world collectively. Okay, well, I think that's where we're going to have to end. Uh, we've been talking to uh, Ramsey Fawaz. His book is The New Mutants, Superheroes and the Radical Imagination of American Comics. It's available online at Amazon, so I suggest you pick it up. It's an interesting read. Uh, you've been watching Comic Culture. I'd like to thank you for watching us this season. This is our last episode. I'd like to thank my crew uh, both semesters for working on this program. I think they've done a great job, and we'd like to thank you for watching. We'll see you again in the fall.